Yeah, I don't need to. Love the car. <laughs> <laughs> really want to hear what you have to say. I don't think <laughs> they out there yesterday. <laughs> I spent the day of parking. <laughs> How you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank good. You. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everybody. We will start this October 12th Committee of the Whole meeting. Uh, call to order, please. Here. 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 All right. First item on the agenda before us this morning is a discussion for letter of interest from the Fergus Falls School District for the Kirkbride Park, and Andrew's going to kick that off. Good awesome. Good morning, uh, <coughs> members of the committee. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, kind of a, a out of the ordinary request, not uh, common business for us here this morning, but uh, maybe a fun way to start the day. Um, as the uh, Adams and McKinley school buildings creep over 90 years old now, the school district is starting to look at what the uh, future options might be for uh, replacing those buildings in a new elementary school. Um, and so they've been working for several months to identify a potential location for a proposed school. And uh, through a handful of conversations with them, they've ultimately landed on uh, the site of Kirkbride Park being their preferred site uh, for a proposed elementary school. Um, it's approximately 14.8 acres. Um, all of the area in front of the, the circle drive as you go towards Fir Avenue. Um, within the letter of interest that uh, Superintendent Drake submitted, it shows those parcels. Um, there's technically, I think, two different parcels, but um, all contiguous and all kind of one area that they're looking at. Um, a, a few things, if the council is interested in pursuing this with the school district, um, everything is contingent and conditioned upon a successful bond referendum. The school would have to obviously pass a bond referendum to build the school, and they're only interested in the site if there is going to be a school located on that site. Uh, they really like the location in terms of uh, being centrally located, uh, being fairly close to their other schools, the bus company, and uh, some of those things that stand out about the site. Um, I recognize that this is a, an odd request. I had some conversations earlier this week that, um, you know, being this is the first time the city council is hearing about this and the staff is, is suggesting perhaps we look at a purchase agreement, there may be other steps that the council wishes to take in between. Um, I didn't think it was appropriate for us to start at the park board or the planning commission because I didn't know if the council had an appetite to talk about this or to sell this property. I didn't think it was appropriate to waste anybody's time with those discussions. But if the council is on board with uh, moving in this direction, I think it wouldn't hurt to um, get feedback from the park board and from the planning commission and have additional dialogue around this um, as we fully vet this concept and this idea. So I'll just leave that uh, lingering here before we discuss it. And then also just to note, <clears throat> if we do move towards a purchase agreement, again, it would be contingent upon a successful referendum. And um, there'll be some work that has to be done to determine what a purchase price may look like. We're trying to determine, uh, because there were bond funds used from the state of Minnesota on this property, any money or proceeds from the sale will go back to the state of Minnesota. They will not be kept by the city. So it's in the schools and the city's best interest to have that dollar amount as low as possible because nobody locally is gonna retain that and it'll be coming from our taxpayers. So um, we're working with uh, Joel Carlson, our lobbyists and some of the folks at the state to determine um, how a purchase price must be set if we have to do an appraisal or, or if it can be just agreed, an agreed upon price or if we need to introduce potentially legislation that would um, set a price, which would then allow us to drive that number down. So I uh, don't need to get into the weeds on that today, but I say that to uh, portray the fact that even if we move towards a purchase agreement, we have several months worth of work ahead of us um, just to be able to define the terms of what that purchase agreement would entail. So it's not gonna be a quick process, um, you know, for the schools, uh, purposes. I think they just need to know that there's an appetite and an interest to get there so they can begin planning for that location 
and then whatever outreach is necessary. The one final piece that I'll mention before we have discussion is that um, this parcel is part of the campus uh, historic designation. So it is listed on the um, National Register of Historic Places. We do not know today what the impact of this would be on the um, entire campus designation. We, of course, have to work through that uh, with the State Historic Preservation Office, but there is the possibility, again, we don't know, we haven't worked through that process yet, that um, if we were to move in this direction, it could <coughs> delist the entire campus um, from historic designation. Now, I don't, I would hope that wouldn't be the outcome, knowing that, you know, Shippo and, and others have a shared goal of seeing the building uh, redeveloped redeveloped and knowing that those historic tax credits are key to doing that. But I think we have to mention it as a, a possibility because we haven't uh, ruled that out. So that's where we're at. I'm looking for a discussion and some direction on, on uh, what you want staff to do next. And, and if there's anything we can um, give back to the school district in terms of feedback or, or uh, where we're at with things. Well, thank you, Andrew, for that update this morning. I'm sure there'll be some discussion. So we'll just kind of open up and go ahead, Brent. Well, I thought about this a lot last night, and I will not be in favor of moving forward with this at all. Um, there's been a few different potential projects that the city's wanted to do, and when every time we bring up historic, they bring up the Kirkbride site, it's historic tax credits and dealing with Shippo. So then why should it be any different with the school district? I mean, even when it comes down to the water park, that was the preferred site, if I remember correctly, and nobody wanted to deal with Shippo and not having to deal with this Thing. So now we're going to be taking away a section of Roosevelt Park that people are using over there and selling a piece of property that the city owns that we could have put this water park on, especially since we already blew the money and we've already brought up sewer and water with the money we got from the state up to that site, which makes it readily available. So if it's something we could have used in the first place and we didn't because of the historic tax credits, then I do not believe we should be selling it to the school for the same reason. Well, I'll maybe just add, I was on the aquatics committee and we also, we had an external consultant. I don't recall exactly. Kirkbride was up there, but it wasn't the, by their ranking, it wasn't the number one scoring matrix site. So for that being said, it, it was up near the top three, I think, based on yeah. scoring. But I, I, I would, I look at it maybe through a different lens. I mean, uh, we've had that for a very long time. Uh, previous councils, current council, and future councils will be making decisions on the Kirkbride. And we've always had a, I think, a shared goal in trying to get redevelopment. Now, this is a little different. It's out in front, but I would be open to explore the path. I mean, I think we don't know enough today to say yes or no. If it jeopardizes the tax credits, that's a, I mean, we need to know that before we would say yes. So I, I, I would support going forward with trying to see how we can make it work. What does it look like? How does it affect current and future development up there? And is it something we can partner with? I think as a community, ever since we took it over, we had a huge opportunity for an entire campus up there. And I think you talked to a lot of citizens. And I think we did not execute very well on that option back in 06 or whenever that time was. So I would be in, in support of at least exploring the option and being open to work with SHPO, work with the school district to at least see what the actual options and outcomes could be. But I think closing the door before it's even open, I think would be short-sighted on our behalf. I would make a motion that we explore this whole thing and, and see where, what we come up with, if we can do it or not, or, or at, at least dig into it and find out if, it, if it's possible. I, I would second that. Thank you. Now I think we can discuss a little bit more if we want to. Anybody have, Scott, do you have any input or? I was expecting Jim to ask for a work session. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can do that too. So. Okay. <laughs> that probably would be a good direction to go. Yeah, I'd, I guess I'd like to make a few comments too. Um, the Regional Treatment Center Historic Campus Master Plan that we just completed a year ago uh, specifically calls out the land, and as Andrew mentioned, as part of the campus. And uh, I can quote from it. It says, the park should remain green space in character and no development of ball fields or other recreational infrastructure should be contemplated. And goes on to say that a key aspect of the RTC campus are the multiple view sheds of the historic buildings, in particular the main Kirkbride building. The importance of the campus grounds was reinforced when in 2016, 
the National Register of Historic Places expanded the 1986 campus boundary to include more of the land surrounding the RTC. Um, so when you talk about this space, the land is part of the historic thing, and that's been uh, pointed out. I just wanted to essentially document that uh, pretty clearly. I think another piece of this, uh, other than my first reaction being that this isn't a very good site for a school, personally I don't believe it is. I think there's at least three other terrific sites for schools elsewhere around town that are better than this. But uh, I think the whole process here is a little bit of a shortcut and it illustrates the need that we have for a more uh, completed strategic or comprehensive plan that says as a city this is what we'd like to see and then the school district is involved with the city as we come to decisions like this. Um, I think if the school district were to come to us and say can we work together with you on locating a site and talking about this that would be a good question. To come and ask for a purchase agreement I think is getting the cart before the horse and is just really uh, too big of an ask and uh, I think that they need to cool their jets just a little bit. Um, this needs to be reviewed by the Economic Development and Land Use Committee, it needs to be reviewed by the Planning Commission. Uh, Andrew mentioned the Park Board would certainly have a say. Um, when we get a variance request from somebody that wants to put a shed in their backyard, it goes through more scrutiny than this kind of a thing that comes up, you know, asking for a pur purchase agreement, and I just think this is too big of a jump. But I would support Jim's idea to go to a work session to at least, you know, <laughs> talk with the school, get them in the same room. I think that would be great. Well, maybe just to add to, I also think we're missing a couple of council members, and I think in the past, I mean, this is a pretty big, has always been a, uh, um, an important topic in our community, and I, I'd like to, you know, make sure we have everybody's input on it. So, you know, where it be, go ahead. Well, I just want to, just just for the record, um, not to dispute anything that Councilmember Kwame said, but just to clarify, mm -hmm. I don't know if the school district necessarily is asking for a purchase agreement at this stage. That's that's my language, quite frankly, um, because I, you know, I, I thought it was something that could accomplish what they're set out to do, and that's to secure the site to be able to go to a referendum. Um, all we got from the school district was the the uh, letter of interest that was submitted, and it doesn't necessarily ask um, for any action. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that the the term purchase agreement is is a term that I'm creating not necessarily the school so not to put words in their mouth but I think in Jasper going in the same you know in the same direction but um, that's my words not theirs so just to be fair well and as you pointed out I think I mean <clears throat> there's a need the school has and they don't want to waste six months exploring that site if if this entire council doesn't even want to explore it so I think to your point, I think, I think there are other avenues that need to be explored as well. But if if we're we're the final stop, right? And if we're going to say no, then why go do all that work and time and energy? So uh, I, I don't know what the council. I think. Uh, I mean, I I, I I would sit with them, Justin, in the sense that I think it's it's worthy of exploring. But I think the first piece is shippo. I mean, that's kind of a phone call or an email, and if 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 they support obviously what's been written previously then there's no point in wasting any more time on it but I think it's you know the school the school needs to do something and you know I think basically at this point in time we wouldn't be spending really any money so it would just be exploratory conversations so on and I think it's just in so that's maybe you know we should have the whole council to kind of make the decision but I think I think we shouldn't just throw it out at this point. I think we should at least explore what Shippo says. If Shippo says you can't, then then it's over. Well, I mean, it, the council could. Uh, I'm not suggesting. This, yeah, but I know. The I council mean, could say that's fine. We don't care about the historic designation or the tax credits, and you yeah. can proceed. I just want you to know your options. I'm not suggesting. But no, I, I also think it would. <laughs> I think if there's something happens up there, then there's a better chance of somebody developing the curb right. And I mean, you know, it's it's been sat there for all this time, and and nobody's developed it with a park in front of it. If all of a sudden there's more traffic up there and there's more people up there, you know, maybe we stand a better chance of actually somebody coming on and developing it. You know, that would be quite a lot of tax dollars collectively going into it to, to put the school up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything everybody said is why I said let's explore it. 
in. And it, it, it doesn't hurt anything to explore. We don't have to approve it after we get all the information back, but at least we've done our job and explored the possibilities of doing this. So before us this morning, we do have a motion. In that motion, then, was it to explore it to uh, a work session? Yes. So, Your Honor, here's what I, I'll do. I don't know whether we need a work session. We, I mean, I, I think I think, I think the school board should be involved we, yeah. in something too. But I think initially we just have to find if, if well, SHPO is agreement. If if SHPO, you know, if SHPO says no, then then, the, then there's we're done. yeah. We'll start that conversation with SHPO with the school because one of the things they're going to ask is, you know, what does your site plan look like? Yeah. So we'll have we'll we'll in conjunction with the school we'll start the conversation with SHPO. And then I think it, it may be a good idea to have a work session just for you guys to be able to ask the school district questions, if nothing else, and, you know, understand more what their intentions are um, and some of those things. So um, I'll, I'll work with the leadership of the school district to set up a work session, but also in the meantime, start those conversations. I'm guessing it's not going to be a simple yes or no answer. They're going to analyze it and they have to, you know, and, they're probably not even going to give us an answer unless we formally submit something, but we'll, we'll work through that process. My, my understanding is that the, that the school board is not looking at using any of the land that's now used for Summerfest up there. So they, they've already looked at that part of it. I, I talked to one of the school board members the other day. Yeah, and I think in some of the conversations I was a part of with the school district um, and the school board, you know, they're fully they want to be if if they if this moves forward and everything is is you know proceeding they want to be as community oriented as possible in terms of you know if they can still accommodate the ski trails summer fest um you know any events in that space um, depending on the layout of that i think they're definitely uh, interested in doing that so i think we have our our direction for now and uh, we'll we'll circle back with with all of you as soon as we have additional information to report and then um, get a date scheduled to, to get the school board and uh, city council together all right well thanks for the update and thanks for the discussion on that item we we, technically we have a motion on the floor <laughs> yeah. well the motion was i thought to so do we want to redefine the motion or are we good just to vote on the motion i think it was you know my to, perception to explore and and to go to a work session Okay. You second that answer? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Pull the same sign. That motion carries. <coughs> Thank you. Item number two, City Project 5960-2023 Street Reconstruction Utility Improvement Project. Brian. Uh, good good uh, morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the council here. <laughs> yeah, before you is in regards to uh, upcoming next year's reconstruction project that staff's been evaluating. Uh, before you right now, I'm currently proposing that looking at a portion of Linden Street uh, and Summit Avenue, basically bounded from Broadway Avenue to Oak Street, and then a second segment on Mortal Street from First Avenue to Broadway Avenue. I've attached an exhibit uh, with your uh, memo before you. I don't believe we can get these on the projection, so uh, my apologies. Uh, so, similar to past reconstruction projects, we're looking to do uh, assess a portion of the street improvement, and this would be through the 429 process. Utility replacements will be funded through the appropriate enterprise funds. So, therefore, is what I'm requesting as well. We'll have to, because we're doing 429 special assessment, <coughs> we have to initiate the preliminary engineering report. And because of that as well, I've also contacted uh, Patch and Messner for their professional services, for appraisal services, and they've also provided a proposal to me as well. So if acceptable, so staff will begin the preliminary engineering report and we'll be doing this in-house design and we'll be doing the presentation to this council at a later date. So bear with me here. My recommendations are to number one, initiate public improvements 5347, 5348, 5349, 7212, 7213, 7214 and 8227, 8228, and 8229. Second recommendation is to combine all these said PIs into a combined project 5960. I'm requesting to order the preliminary engineering report <coughs> for CP 5960 and to accept Patch and Messner's professional services proposal for appraisal services in a not to exceed amount of $9,000. And I'll welcome to any questions you might have. Are we able to do that in one motion? Mm -hmm. All of them? I would make that motion. 
I'll, I'll second, second it. Okay. Krista gets that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> being greedy this morning, getting them all in. <laughs> Any other uh, questions, discussion for Brian on this item? Question. Is, this is uh, water, sewer, sanitary sewer, the whole shebang, as well as the, it's not just the mill and overlay. We're talking yes, all the way down, everything under the streets. We'd be looking, replacing full utility reconstruction as well. Yeah, It'll, it's timely. Some in the Laurel are in pretty bad shape. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Among others, really but yeah. got to start somewhere. <laughs> Correct. Okay, I've, been, I've been yelling about Summit for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, we have a motion before us. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Pull the same sign. Motion's carried. Do you guys like that on the consent agenda? Sure. I yes. failed on the first one. Is that. Uh, do we need to move that to the consent or? I, I think, think leave it off. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you guys. <clears throat> All right, item number three. Brian, you're up again, City Project 5959. Thank you. Uh, if you recall, recently the council initiated the uh, Stanton Avenue reconstruction project as public improvement 5959, uh, the extension reconstruction of Stanton Avenue from Union Avenue to Broadway. Uh, based on anecdotal evidence and historical counts, we believe the underlying soil beneath Stanton Avenue is very unsuitable soil. However, the extent is not known. Therefore, I contacted Terracon for geotechnical exploration services. In general, they'll do a con conduct a series of soil borings through the pavement and collect soil samples, prepare a geotechnical engineering report, and then provide recommendations in that report to uh, mitigate some of these potential unsu unsuitable soils. Uh, the, secondly, um, like the prior project, we don't know the full estimates yet. However, I believe we're going to portion of the street will be assessed with this project as well. Uh, therefore, we'll be doing the same. We'll have to do I solicited Patch and Messner for appraisal services uh, to complement the 429 process. Um, so at this time, I'm requesting to a resolution accepting Patch and Messner's professional service proposal for appraisal services not to exceed the amount of $11,000. And also a resolution accepting Terracon professional services proposal for geotechnical exploration in a not to exceed amount of $8,900. And I'll open up to any questions you might have. As much as Summit needs it, this needs it even worse. So I would make that motion. I'll second. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Any questions for Brian? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Pull same sign. Motion's carried. Would you guys like that on the consent as well? Yep. yep. Okay, thank you. I'm number four, downtown riverfront project phase two update. <clears throat> yes, thank you again. Um, back in the September 19th city council meeting, there was a request for a clarification on two items for the downtown riverfront project. One being the utility hookups for the east side, east block, and the second one being uh, some differences between the flow through splash, piss, splash pad system and the recirculating system. So to begin with, on the, during the phase one, we, consult, we consulted food vendors regarding the number of utility hookups uh, necessary for to combine phase one and two project areas. Based on industry, industry standards, the number of parking stalls and event space, it was suggested that three hookups would be sufficient. Therefore, three hookups, utility hookups, were installed in the phase one project area. We can certainly add another utility hookup to the East Block phase two project area, uh, but we simply did not in the initial design just based on for budgetary reasons and cost savings. Uh, but I'd leave it up to the council if they want to direct myself and staff to explore, uh, get a proposal request from Comstock. Uh, for utility hookups for the East Block Phase Two area. So, all right. Well, thanks for that. Is um, I don't know how many activities you've had down there on that West Block in terms of utility needs, but do we have any data I think showing? It should be explored. Data we showing we need explore. more. Yeah. yeah, I think we should explore it and see what the cost would be. Okay. I suppose where where would that. you put it? I mean, I would say, I mean, it's like, where are you going to place it? Because it's not, I mean, the other one, we you kind of have a building and then you go. Yeah. In this case, there's a building over that end, right? The new restroom building. And so having hookups on that building in a similar way that you've got hookups on the first one would seem appropriate. And then having hookups along the street, similar to the ones on the current street. I think those two locations at least would be good. If there was a third one along by the 
alleyway. I suppose that would probably be plenty, but two or three locations seems like it would be uh, worth doing. We can uh, I, I would say as well before we go ahead, I mean, how, how many people have utilized the electric and how many use, people have utilized water in the current marketplace? Just, you know, because putting water and electric on the far side of the parking lot obviously is going to be expensive run. You know, I'd rather see two on this side than you know, one on that side that might be more expensive. So data that I have currently is from farmers market vendors pretty much exclusively and so far I have not seen any responses saying anyone's hooking up to the water. Um, but many of them use electric and we've had several events where um, we've had at least one food truck located at every single um, 50 volt hookup. So those are getting used and what I'm envisioning for phase two would likely be a similar usage so we maybe don't need um, water hookups for vendors necessarily in phase two but having accessibility to some 50 volt by the building by the street by um, the alleyway would probably be they'd probably be used if i may mr chair i believe we have plenty of time to discuss this further as well yeah. uh, we have not had the pre-construction meeting yet for this phase two um, i believe it would be starting next spring as well perhaps mobilization but we have plenty of time so i just wanted to follow up based on previous council requests so and based on the conversation and the information i think it's it's worth exploring to see um of those all the way across the parking lot and cost to, then we can make a decision at a later date how important um, you know the need is to have that for the facility itself. And we can do some outreach too and ask some questions of vendors, yeah. see what they want to use. Go ahead, Brent. Where on the alley are we talking? I mean, because everything that's going in is going to be right up by the river. Why would there be to be one back by the alley? We have one by the alley on phase one. You do? Uh, yep, we do. And it has been used when that entire parking lot is sh is shut down. It, it makes a nice enclosed so you can have, you know, food truck over by the building, food truck by the alley, food truck on the end. So it's okay, kind of so this is like after hours because like the biggest thing that concerns me is the parking over there for the senior yeah. center. If any of this is done mm -hmm. during the days, I don't want to see any of those, you know, spots taken up where these people got to walk to get to that facility. Right. Good point. Duly noted. Okay, are we good with that? We'll just yeah. we'll get more information when we actually need to. And I have second one second item for the flow through on the yes uh, Thank splash you. pad water. Thank you. Yes, uh, there are two types of splash pad systems. There, number <clears throat> one being a flow through, and the second being a recirculating. In a flow through system, the water from the splash pad drains into the storm sewer, the sanitary sewer, or can be captured and repurposed for irrigation. In a recirculating system, such as the one that we have prov provided in the phase two, this is an eco friendly way to conserve water and operates more like a pool with tanks, chemicals, filters. Water used at the splash pad is filtered and then chemically treated, stored in a tank, and then reused in the system throughout operation. Uh, this recirculating system does have a higher upfront cost and a flow through uh, due to the equipment required to, uh, as I just noted. The downtown riverfront site does not have adequate space for a rain garden or a retention basin to capture the used water from the irrigate for irrigation purposes. Draining the water into the storm sewer and from there into the river is not a desirable outcome either. If a flow through system were installed, it would need to drain into the city sanitary sewer. Depending on the programming, a flow through splash pad system can easily top 5 million gallons of water usage in a season. Uh, the water used in the river feature area would continuously flow into the sanitary sewer while the river feature is operational. Not only would the city be using a significant amount of our own city water, but then it would also be having the extra cost of being treated in the city sanitary sewer system as well in the plants. Uh, the flow through design provides colder water since it is continuously drawing from the city's water distribution system, which probably would not be very uncomfortable for users at the, as well. So 
Also, additionally, local and regulatory agencies promote and enforce water conservation measures in an effort to conserve water and cons considering a large variety of proposed water features, the continuously flowing waterfall features during normal operations, treatment costs, and user comfort. Therefore, a recirculating system was preferred splash pad design in the downtown riverfront phase two. So I'll just open up to any questions. And I, like I just want to note, this is just a follow up from previous requests. Thanks, Brian. Good information to note. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys that I golf with was a, uh, a park superintendent in Utah, and they had both. Both they had it, splash pads with the flow through and with the recirculating, and he said the recirculating is by far more expensive. All the problems that they've had with it and, and upkeep maintenance was <coughs> much more expensive after the fact. <coughs> Just wanted to put that out. Yeah, that was kind of what I wanted to know what the cost difference was between the two of them for operation and maintenance. I mean, that would be something to have in order to be able to make a, you know, actual decision on it. Because like he said, you know, that other one's got a lot more mechanicals to it. it could end up in the long run costing us more money. And then in the long run, you know, I mean, just the amount of water and sewer, you know, that we have to, you know, treat versus the thing what is the cost savings on either one of them would be nice to know i just Andrew. gonna make, and brian can can uh, expand on this but we've already we've already designed and bid this and awarded a contract for our research and we system. committed so i think we've made that decision okay and, yeah. um, <laughs> <Go> ahead, <Brian>. change order <laughs> well, oh. <laughs> ding 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 there goes the money we we could read uh, Yes, request a proposal request for inserting a different design into the project. Hmm. I believe it be, might be a deduct and everything, but then once again, if we did that and the contractor Comstock was able to provide that and everything, we'd also look at our operational expenses added too. So not only do your construction costs, we look at those operational. Uh, once again, like I mentioned, uh, looking at our rates for our distribution supply of water, but then also our treating the water at our wastewater treatment plant are amongst two minimum operation costs we'd have to consider. The water, the water going to our plant out of that pool shouldn't be that hard to treat, though. I mean, it's no. not, not like sewage. Uh, Brian, is the water in this considered the same, uh, up, need to be the same requirements as a typical swimming pool? Or where I guess I'm going is, could we put in a well and use untreated water and just go that route? And have a flow through system where it comes out of a well goes through this and flows into the river and then there is any issue with chemicals and treatment and all of that or is that even not possible for some reason that i don't know i would say it's probably not possible the dnr I would not give you the permission to run a well and then run it straight into the river you'd have to treat the water going into the river so it, i mean and water technology on treatment is moved a lot so I, I think you know you, preservation of water is probably as much king as anything and so I think you know if we have a recirculating system we, we should be able to figure out how to make it work I mean as I say technology has moved a lot on water treatment in the last literally even in the last five years so I think I think I, I mechanical systems are are expensive to operate not, but I think we've got a lot better at doing them. I don't think you would, the DNR, I doubt would give you even a permit to do that today, not for 5 million gallons. Anything that's mechanical, you're going to have problems with. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere along the line. And then my guess would be, too, is coming out of the well is hard water, which is going to create rust. So then you got to treat the water before it gets sprayed yeah. on the million dollar facility. It, it's, the water is very, very hard. If, you have high in iron, high in arsenic that comes out of the ground. I remember, the, uh, Mr. Chair, the last well the DNR did permit us to use to augment Lake Alice, a small well, existing well at the northeast, it was an existing well, and that that uh, appropriation permit, they only granted it for a year or two, so uh, they, the DNR's take on it is not, it's not, a, I guess, a appropriate way to uh, use groundwater to, you know, for surface water and everything, it's not a good conservation effort as well more so to protect the underlying aquifer. 
How do you have a comment? Yeah, just as recent as last year with the drought cycle that we're in, we had to impose water restrictions. So I would think that would be a pur purpose that would be deemed not uh, necessary. So if we were to impose water restrictions again, we might have to shut it down. If we did not have a recirculating right. system. Yeah. yeah. That wouldn't be good to spend all that to have it and then not be able to utilize it. So I, I guess I'm what I'm hearing, I mean, it's it's good discussion and, and um, uh, certainly something that is good to bring forward and get some information on. But I think it sounds like we've already kind of made a decision that's that ship sailed. If, I just as long want as, to throw the information out no, that I've, I've gotten from the guy that directly was involved with. Yep. And th thanks for the update. But I think what I'm hearing is we're just move as we already <clears throat> approved. Does that sound fair? Yeah. I mean, to go back now and redesign it would look foolish to. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks for the update, Brian. Uh, item number five, <clears throat> stormwater management ordinance. Yes. Thank you. Um, on September 14th, the MTCA provided us written responses in regards to their audit of the city's stormwater man management program, referred to as MS4 as well. A majority of the MPCA alleged violations can be resolved with site plan reviews, construction inspections, and city code updates. The city has procedures and written forms to resolve these requirements of the MS4 permits. <clears throat> Since the uh, response to alleged violations from the MPCA, <clears throat> approximately 13 pages of it. Uh, we have <laughs> responded to the MPCA with facts and circumstances to consider in its process for determining enforcement actions required for in regards to their audit towards the city. So uh, on the second page included in the memo, I've provided a list of city code updates we're gonna have to uh, update and incorporate into our city code. And I've also provided a, a red line version of uh, chapter 152 that does have the city code updates in regards to this topic incorporated into the length uh, in, into our city code i can go through these <coughs> until if you prefer or um just in general they're just requesting just uh develop regulatory mechanisms for all kinds of sorts of things and everything as well so like i said i can go into this in detail or you can just I'm requesting a motion directing the city attorney to draft the stormwater management ordinance revisions for chapter 152. And I'll open up to any questions you might have. Thanks, Brian, for that quick update. And go ahead, Scott, if you have a question. I got a couple questions for you, Brian. As I've read through the, it's actually blue line, red line version, isn't it? Am I understanding that right? Correct. It was blue. <laughs> All right. The, the concern that I would have, whether it's this ordinance or any other one, is if we're putting a more significant burden on whoever's building something or developing something and to what degree that's you know a heavy extra ask or anything and there were a couple of paragraphs having to do with inspections and maintenance of records and um, the the time frames for things and whatnot that if I was a developer I would think this is a lot to have to keep track of for example there's a line that says the owner shall maintain records and provide annual maintenance and inspection reports. And then this non-routine maintenance must occur every five years and inspections shall be done weekly. It was on another point. And the date and amount of rainfall events greater than a half an inch must be recorded. Uh, do people actually do that? I mean, do you have contractors or developers that will keep inspection records and track rainfall amounts and things like that? <laughs> Or is that in, 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 here, Mr. Sherry, um, Councilman Kwame? Yes, throughout the state, it's uh, it's a very powerful program, um, and that's where, like I had mentioned, it's an unfunded mandate all the way from the federal government to the MPCA administered through the MPCA. Mm -hmm. However, it lies on us because we're a municipality of over 10,000 people, population. Uh, we're required to enforce, be the enforcement action at the local level for this so um my in my uh general perspective on all this is i try to achieve minimum standards when it comes to new enforcement languages and everything and that's before you right here is the minimum requirements that the mpca is requesting we take on or else they will be looking to levy uh, Damp, uh, enfor taking enforcement action towards the city, and they have in the, some other communities as well. 
Uh, but you're absolutely right to answer your question some of these. Yes, there's a lot of documentation. We try to streamline the process and everything. We're looking at new electronic software, all kinds of things. But I, I know, honestly, I do have a staff member that's pretty much dedicated to this program almost full time. And so as you talk about enforcement, is there some, uh, what's the negative to the city if we don't do this? If we say, you know, we're just going to do the minimum or less, does the Fed or government or some other entity then come in and fine us? Or what, what happens to us yep. then if we don't do what this is suggesting? That's precisely what they can levy towards the city. Fine. <clears throat> And they have been in other communities. They have been in other communities. And it's not just cities, uh, private contractors, companies, everything as well. So um, there will be, not to change the subject and everything, but there's move for PFOS coming. We'll be coming for the council in regards to new sampling that they're going to require, not at our wastewater treatment plants and also at our local landfill. I don't, don't quite want to get into that yet, but we'll be coming before you in regards to that topic as well. So before you right now, just in regards to stormwater. There is a lot of record keeping, as I noted, and yes, the rainfall, everything. Uh, we There has been a lot of progress in regards to having, having standard boilerplates for documenting all these measures, but yes, uh, developers, but this is not just a Fergus Falls thing. This is throughout the state and countrywide in many instances. So it's gonna be a unfortunate norm in some areas of construction. The MPCA has got a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would agree. And a lot of their mandates are unfunded. I mean, we have to fund what they want us to do. There's no state money. So, they, yeah, they don't provide us any resources to do what they're telling mm -hmm. us to do. It does put a lot in your hands. Uh, the one line in here reads, the city engineer shall retain enforcement powers for assuring adequate operation and maintenance activities. So I guess you get that big hammer <laughs> to make this all happen. <laughs> so... Uh, it's interesting. Somebody's got to go to jail. <laughs> Shouldn't be the city council. <laughs> He's got big shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> Put good and things in place. And I, I think the biggest thing is, like, obviously, we don't have a choice as such. I mean, we have to update them in accordance with the request and the law. Um, but it's how do we communicate it. Uh, I think the changes in communication is the bigger key. You know, so that, you know, going back to Council Member Kwame's thing, it's like, you know, we we want we want obviously contractors to continue to do their work, but you know they have to understand that these impositions are are, are a federal mandate, not a city mandate, and we don't want them to fall foul of of the law either. So it will be a good job for Gene. Yeah. Well, we've been as a city, I think, we've been subject to some criticism when it comes to being business friendly. Those kind of comments come up and it's like, hey, we didn't do this. <clears throat> we were forced to do this. Mm. And it just seems kind of odd that we have to vote to approve something that we don't have a choice. You know, if we got a gun to our head, we've got to do it. It's like, well, then why just just do it then? Don't ask us to vote for it. It's, <laughs> it's more or less a mandate. Yeah. This, this is what we do. <clears throat> being that you mentioned it, do we have a request to um, recommend to the company? That. Thank you, Jim. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Krista. Now that we've had all the discussion. Yeah, it's kind of backwards, but that, eh, it's okay. That's how we do it sometimes. Mm -hmm. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Same. same sign opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. You're off the hot seat now. now. Come <laughs> Item number six, Pebble Lake Golf Course Clubhouse HVAC System. Guy Taylor. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Um, with the opening of the Palmer's restaurant at the Pebble Lake Golf Course, uh, it was evident that our air conditioning system out there was very inadequate. Uh, Pebble Lake Golf Club spent thousands of dollars this summer trying to repair them, get the systems back up and running so that it was semi-comfortable in the clubhouse. Um, it's just shown to be uh, just a money pit. So what's being proposed is the city front uh, money probably upwards of $50,000 to replace the systems, heating and air conditioning, and then Pebble Lake Golf Club would reimburse the city 50% of that cost over five years. Um, Palmer's is looking at potentially year-round operations, so it would be replacement of heating and air conditioning. So um, we're recommending that this be uh, 
entered into an agreement with Pebble Lake Golf Club and that we be able to use money uh, that's been set aside in the golf course's uh, budget and uh, use it for this purpose instead of the siding project that we had been saving the money for. So if uh, it's acceptable, we're, we've already received one quote and we're seeking at least one more and uh, and we'll come back to you with the uh, approval of whichever quote we you'd like to look at. So Kevin is here too to speak to it if you'd like him to, but uh, it was obvious in the clubhouse and then especially in the kitchen area, the staff in the kitchen were working in 100 plus degree temps many days this summer. So it's definitely a needed project. Thanks. I will offer that. Thanks, Guy. I'll second I'll that. Oh, and right. and I will I will say that that the system that they have out there has not been replaced in I'll bet you 15 20 years. Mm -hmm. they, we've added added a few things to right. the kitchen this last year, but the, the system is, they've been patching on it for years, and it's it's time for a new system. So, a motion by Jim and a second by Brent, and. I just want to take an opportunity to, you know, I, I utilize that course and um, the restaurant, and I think um, just want to publicly note and thank Kevin for him and his staff and, and the city for working. Um, really changed the face of, of, of the golf course, and I think there's a lot of people that come outside of the community that get to see the new the new things happening out there. And so a lot of, a lot of exciting things are happening, and a lot of youth are getting into to golf, which is awesome to see. Um, I just have one question on, uh, I don't think we've ever used this as um, uh, year round as far as the heating side, are we comfortable with insulation and just making sure that we can um, heat it or do we need to look at that pot? Yeah, the, the siding project that we were looking at would have included insulation too. We know that it's inadequate. So um, Public Golf Club knowing that too we're just going to realize that they're going to be paying more for heating the building, well, and air conditioning at this point due to delaying that project. And that might be something down the road we can tackle. But again, back to my original point was a lot of good things are happening out there. It's it's fun to see and and the the, the experience for uh, local residents and residents outside our community that come and play is pretty exciting. So come a long way in the last few years. So thank you for that. Any other questions, comments, or? Okay. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion's carried. Are we good with that going on the consent? Consent. Yep. Okay. Item number seven, a Lake Alice planning discussion. We're talking a lot about water today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> Your Honor, uh, committee members, this is probably more about geese, but of course oh. that impacts water quality and, and all those things as well but um, I'm, I'm a placeholder on the agenda and I'm actually going to turn it over to Councilmember Kwame um, the mayor and, and Councilmember Kwame have received some correspondence from a resident of Lake Alice and there was some action items that this person was hoping the city would discuss and I think uh, Councilmember Kwame is prepared to uh, propose some concepts this morning so I'll just turn it over to him if that's all right since I live right on Lake Alice uh, and I've been involved with the Lake Alice neighborhood group that has met infrequently but somewhat regularly over the last several years uh, the people in that group and, a, and a, a couple of people in particular came to me saying you know can't we do something and then they also got a hold of the mayor as Andrew mentioned and a letter was written with some specific questions regarding you know geese management water quality management and so the conversation now is at the point of well you know what are we going to do about it and We've got a number of committees and a number of advisory boards and things like that already in place, uh, whether you're talking, you know, the golf board, as we just heard from, or the bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee, those kinds of things. And it seems like it would be appropriate for us to have a committee established to take a look at these issues surrounding Lake Alice and do the research and do some of the legwork and to accomplish some progress on some of these questions um, you know, on a volunteer basis from a group that's interested and has a stake in the matter. And so to that end, I'd like to propose a motion that we create such a committee uh, or that the mayor create such a committee and then task that committee with uh, looking at medium or short-term, medium-range, long-range 
uh, potential solutions uh, regarding these issues of water quality and and uh, geese management initially. So that, I don't know if that motion came out very clearly. You want me to try that again? <laughs> I think it's pretty clear. Okay. You did a good job with that. Could it be like a subcommittee within the park and rec or another committee? I think it would almost have to be a subcommittee off, off the park and rec. Or would it be that or natural, natural, natural resources? Natural resources, yeah. So at this at this point in the conversation, I would expect the conversation, you know, the topics to primarily be regarding water quality and management of the geese and those kinds of things that might, you know, we'd be checking with the DNR and with Fish and Wildlife and with all of the kinds of things that have to do with, you know, stormwater drainage and that kind of a thing. At some point in the future, it wouldn't surprise me if this group also then wanted to expand the conversation to other needs around the lake, whether it was you know, utility reconstruction and the, all of the stuff that goes into Brian's department with the streets and everything. So whether it was specific to the park and rec or whether it w at some point grows beyond that, I don't know. I think it could stand alone, but if it was to be a subcommittee under another area, that's, I, I'm not, you know, I don't hold one way or another. That's fine. I just have a suggestion. So right now, the Natural Resources Advisory <coughs> Committee, when they got codified, brought into the city, their membership was asked to reapply to be part of this, you know, the, the same group, but as part of the overall hierarchy of the boards and commissions. And currently, we don't have enough members for them to meet. So if, if there are interested members of this Lake Alice group who maybe have a broader interest in natural resources overall, if they'd be willing to come and join the Natural Resources Advisory Committee, get that group back up and running, and then there could be a subcommittee of those members with the specific interest in Lake Alice that could continue to meet. Um, maybe then it could morph into its own thing, but it could solve two, maybe two issues at once. I, I think that would be a workable option. I don't have a problem with that. Go ahead, Bill. And just as a reminder, and Brian, you'll probably help me. Um, we did a, a quite a bit of work on Lake Alice a number of years ago, looking at all these issues from stormwater management, the traps, all those kind of things. I remember we looked at a DNR permit. I think that was water was declined permit. by that. We weren't granted that by the DNR. So. For this group, there's a bunch of work that was already done a number of years ago, so they wouldn't have to start at ground zero. Certainly pull what was put together, and that may answer a lot of the questions already. So, And I was going to ask that question. It, it was never probably a, an official farmwise city committee, but they had kind of a committee established. What were they called? Like the Friends of Lake Alice? Mm -hmm. or Neighborhood group. Lake Alice Neighborhood group. They, there you go. And they still meet occasionally. So they're, they're not, they're they're not very likely it will be a meeting, you know, soon because often before Halloween they'll want to get together and talk about you know, what are we going to do for Halloween this year? Because <laughs> you know I mean? it involves a lot of traffic and parking and things. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, do we have as many geese in town after Otter Tail closed down the plant and, and the river freeze is over? We don't, and I, I don't think a lot of them come back. So was, I think we're down on geese. There was less geese this year on Lake Alice than previously. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a lot of the ones that yeah. have been out a long time where they're wounded and they can't get out of here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. We, we have a couple on the golf course that are limping around. The, yeah. They're still <laughs> our summer home. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sorry. We have a second to the I'll motion. Second. To Scott's <laughs> motion. To, okay. Do we have another discussion on other... Uh, for the for the Lake Alice community <coughs> being underneath the NRAC, I think that seems a positive fit. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Both same sign. Motion's carried. And did you have a, a follow up, or is that just that's it? That I think that answers my question. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lynn, for the reminder. I do not believe there's any additional items to come before us this morning. Just a couple announcements. October 17th, 5.30 here in the Council Chambers, we will be meeting on Monday night. Uh, November 2nd uh, will be our next committee of the whole meeting, 7 o'clock in the Chambers. And then a uh, big reminder, November 2nd, we all know the leaves are falling off the trees. And so 
Bag leaf pickup begins at 6 a.m. on November 2nd. Guy, does it go the whole week or just that day? Just that day. Just that day. So get your um, leaves bagged and out to the boulevard so we can pick them up for you. Clara. Just a reminder that we have strategic plan meetings tomorrow. You're all on a committee. You should have been receiving calendar updates and invites. Um, it's in person. It's in person, so please check check your city email accounts. Jim, I sent it to your other account. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see you there. Thank you. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I got the original one, and I replied that I would be there. So. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we, we know that you need Barb to keep you on track. So. Yeah. <laughs>